The panel that we have assembled for you today includes a very prominent and highly esteemed former head of state in the person of President Joachim Chisano, who we have on the panel with us, Professor Ian Shapiro from Yale University. We have Akere Timuna from Transparency International. We have Winnie Bianyima with us from Oxfam and Mo Ibrahim, who requires hardly any introduction, who's very well known for the Ibrahim Foundation's index that measures governance. So I'd like to welcome our entire panel. And I'd like to hand over and start with President Chisano to share some of his insights and thoughts with us on the importance of governance, particularly in a context where Africa is seeing a significant interest in its investment opportunities, in new forms of resource extraction, new forms of strategic resources that are being discovered, gas, oil, many of the areas where the continent has had significant challenges in the past. And we are really in the midst of a wealth of experience in the form of President Chisano. Thank you very much. Uh, I have to say that uh, I'm happy to notice that in Africa, there's a more and more good awareness about the value of governance, uh, democracy, and leadership. Uh, the world is changing. And so Africa also is changing. Fortunately, uh, I may conclude that Africa is changing towards uh, the, the positive. Our people have, uh, are, are more, more educated, more inquisitive, more demanding. And so this uh, requires uh, also a change in the attitude of the leadership. Uh, and the, the attitude of leadership changes uh, when there is a good interaction between the people and uh, the, the leadership itself. Uh, and uh, when I say that people are more inquisitive, uh, they want to know how they are being ruled in each country. So participation of the people is very important so that they understand what are the uh, objectives of the government, of their leaders, and uh, they have to participate with their inputs, with their views. And so it's important to uh, bring uh, these people into power. As uh, normally we say that the power is with the people, but uh, in the past it was not always like that. So uh, we in, in, in Mozambique, we have done a, a lot in that, in that sense. Uh, we had a participation. Uh, you have referred here uh, women participating in, 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 in Rwanda. But let me say that in, in Mozambique also, we have done a lot in that field. 35% of the members of parliament are women, and this is the target for the SADC region. Uh, so we may have a bit more in, in, in the cabinet. Also have a, a many women in business and in a, a public sector. We also have women. And this comes through a, a, an open dialogue with the a, a civil society and the private sector. Uh, so, uh, well, to start with, uh, I would stop there, and we'll take any other questions. Thank you very much for that input. Certainly, we see a new active citizenry emerging on our continent. We have much greater levels of transparency youth participation requiring much more uh, input in terms of accountability, in terms of looking at accountability for decisions, whether those decisions are in resource sectors, whether those decisions are in terms of extractive industries. When we look at some of the trends on governance, Mo, your index has measured governance, methodologically very sound measurement systems that have been constructed in your index. 
You have, however, in recent years decided not to award rewards for governance. <laughs> what have been the reasons for the thought processes in terms of your foundation's decisions around awarding and not awarding rewards for governance on our continent? Right. I think uh, these are two totally separate issues. Uh, the, the index is a measure, scorecard, for governance in each country. Sorry? Push the mic closer. Uh, sorry. Uh, I, I was just saying that these are two separate issues. Uh, the governance is a scorecard for the performance uh, of governance. We think governance is about deliverables, what, what governments need to deliver to its own people. And uh, we measure 88 parameters there, comes under really four uh, uh, major areas, namely uh, rule of law and safety, human development, which helps in education, etc., economic opportunity, which is management of public finances, infrastructure, water, electricity, all that stuff, and uh, finally participation and rights. Uh, so we, we measure everything governments really need to deliver to its own people. And we think that's an important scorecard to evaluate the progress of governance over the year in each country. It's a basis for a healthy, objective discussion between government and, and people, and business, and uh, to, to really know what is the best practice, how to move forward. The price is something completely different, and uh, that's done actually by the price committee, which I'm not a member of. Uh, the price is really for leadership. And uh, what we're looking for here is excellence in leadership. Uh, leaders who come and really take their countries forward and uh, sometimes have to make really tough decisions. And this can happen in countries which are probably down in the, in the index. Uh, President Chisano was uh, our first laureate. Uh, Mozambique is quite low in the uh, uh, governance uh, table because there is lack of infrastructure, there is lack you know, education, health, etc. Understandable. But that doesn't stop a leader who come and really change the country, introduce democracy, liberalize the economy, stop the civil war, saves a lot of lives. This is and a great act of leadership, which is honored. So let us separate the two issues uh, uh, from each other. You say we haven't offered the prize in the, uh, well, in six years we had three winners, and uh, I'm glad to see all of them actually here. Uh, three years we didn't have a winner. And uh, this is not our problem actually somebody else's problem. What we do is we don't lose credibility. If there's a winner, there is a winner. If there's no winner, there's no winner. Mm -hmm. And we don't see any problem with that. And uh, we're looking for excellence. Excellence is not a normal commodity. I mean, in, I've asked many questions in Europe always when I have some event there. And my answer always has been, okay, we are happy to offer this to a European leader. Can you tell me a European leader who deserves this prize? <laughs> and people just laugh in Europe. So you look around them and say, what, what European leader should we win this? So it is, it is we're looking for exceptional people. And uh, we'll, we'll, we'll just keep our standards there. And uh, we're not worried about that at all. May, may, may I? Absolutely, Your Excellency, if you like. add Something which uh, people asked me the same question uh, and what more didn't say is that this uh, prize is given to the leaders who are out of government, not those who are in. And those who have been out in the last three years and sometimes there's no, no one. Three years ago, there's no... no In the last three years, left we office. left office. <laughs> so. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that is, is the problem. It's, uh, it's, uh, that they are not there. 
Uh, but now this year there will be many elections and, and maybe next year we'll have a, a lot of choice. Yes, but we, we, we cannot talk. We please understand I'm not a member of the Bryce Committee. It is a completely independent, uh, very respectable committee. We have three Nobel Prize winners there and uh, ex-readers, etc. Uh, so it is inappropriate for me even to comment on this year crop of presidents. I mean, it's, it's nothing to do with me, really. It is a committee declares that, and we, we have a frame of work, and that's it. I thank you. I have a suspicion we're going to have an avalanche of tweets dealing with this matter, and indeed potentially nominating candidates. <laughs> I'd like to then just turn to Akira, because when we debate debates on governance, we often simply look at the state and we look at public sector leadership. But when we look at issues of governance, accountability, there certainly is an equal measure in terms of looking at the role of the private sector and other stakeholders. Indeed, as Robert also introduced the topic, where you sit in Transparency International, how do you look at these issues of governance and accountability, looking at all role players, not only engaging with role players who happen to be in elected public office, but all the role players who are relevant to the governance debate? Well, at GI, we look at it as a systemic problem, because it is systemic. And I think that's the error we, we make, looking, looking at the problem in snippets. And I agree with the President that uh, the level of awareness has increased. It is true. But when you get to that junction of awareness, do you go towards acceptance or you go towards change? And what worries me in Africa is that in many cases, we are going towards acceptance of the situation. I'll give you a quick example. I won't tell you what country. The election just took place, and I met a friend. I said, listen, man, who are you going to vote for? He looked at me and says, Ali Baba. I said, but Ali Baba is not a candidate. He says, well, with him, it's clear. There are only 40 thieves. The other people I really don't know. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, but that, that is acceptance of a situation. It's not good enough. We want to go towards awareness that empowers the citizens and causes him to demand change. If we don't do that, we will never make that quantum leap. And that's what bothers me in the way we're looking about problems of governance. Is it is systemic, and things are happening. Look at Malawi. They moved from uh, paying salaries in cash, the move to turning at 160,000 workers to be paid through banks. And every month, they save $2 million. So there are practical things that are systemic. The use of cash in Africa is amazing, from ministers to presidents to people who go on, on, on mission, when there's a solution. And I think that there are little things that, that can be done to make sure that this con con this, the, con the, 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 the country moves ahead. The other problem is, which addresses part of your question is, can we expect those who are accused of mismanaging the system to bring about change? In other words, can you actually expect the fish to, to vote the budget to buy the hooks? I mean, that is a tall order. And I think that is where all the actors are important. And that's the problem we have, is that in our continent, we believe that traction towards better governance can only be gotten by those who are in charge of running the system. If you don't open it up and bring in other actors, you will have the problem. But I think there are good examples, practices going on that we don't look at. And you know, for example, if you look at all countries in Africa where you've had a vice president, the transition has been phenomenal. Look at Malawi, what happened? Look at Ghana, look at Nigeria. And I'm saying that things are happening but for some reason, you know, we are looking elsewhere. Ian, and from where you sit, looking at some of the possible innovations that can also assist in terms of some of the challenges that we confront in the governance debate, where do you see some of the innovations leading us? Because when we look at the work that you do, certainly on competition, particularly also electoral competition, one of the key challenges is in the political sphere when we are looking at governance. What innovations can you see emerging from the work and the research that you have done? 
Well, I think, thank you for the question, and I think that it's, it's very well put at the World Economic Forum that we're talking about political governance in the World Economic Forum, because I think some of the most important changes that need to occur to, to support and institutionalize and make systemic the turnover of power is actually rooted in the economy, because it's, it's certainly good to have changes in rules such as term limits and this sort of thing can, but it, but it the, can, can have an effect. But at the end of the day, unless the incentives are aligned, uh, changes in the rules will not turn out to be enough. Political scientists routinely say that a country can't be said to be a democracy until a government has twice lost an election and given up power. That's actually a pretty stern test. By that test, the US was not a democracy until 1840. Uh, Japan and India were not democracies until pretty recently. South Africa would not be a democracy yet. So it's, a, it's a pretty stern test. And if, if you look at what is the best predictor of when countries, when alternation starts to occur, the, the curious thing is that the best predictor of alternation is alternation. So the, the, is, the issue is how does it get started? Once, you, once governments become habituated to giving up power, having lost elections, a big part of the battle is over. And if you go back and look, for example, at the at the first turnout over in the US in 1800, it was very unclear for a period of several weeks that there was actually going to be a turnover of power. Um, and the more you study this, the more you see that a big part of the reason was that all of the political players saw alternatives to politics, uh, that politics was not winner-take-all politics or loser-lose-all politics because there were other things for Jefferson and, and um, uh, his contemporaries to go off and do. And I think that, that um, even today, I, I saw an, an article in a newspaper a couple of days ago that Al Gore is now worth $200 million he's made from his various movies and things since he left office. Um, if, it's, if you want to want politicians to be willing to give up power, it's got to be attractive for them to do that. And the key to that is diversification of the economy. So long as you have uh, very undiversified economies, then whoever gets to control the commanding heights of the economy uh, controls everything else. And I think that's why people are so reluctant to give up political power. And so. Uh, for that reason, I think it's, it's, it's very propitious that many of the economic sessions have been discussing things like uh, diversification of the economy, because I think in the end, that's going to be uh, vital for politics. Thank you. Winnie, where you sit in the overseas development assistance space, do you see changes and alterations in how the development agencies globally are looking at questions of governance? Well, I'd like to respond to that question by um, focusing my answer on Africa. We see that in Africa for the foreseeable future, Africa is going to be depending on its natural resources. Its natural resource wealth will be what our people will depend on. And we believe that unless we can get our leaders to take responsibility for the collection of these resources, the allocation of these resources, and the spending of these resources, and do this in a transparent manner, and create an environment where people can use their power to hold them to account, then really uh, we will not be able to take the continent out of, of, of poverty. So for us, governance for Africa, the big issue we want to focus on is the governance of the natural resources. And in that regard, we are looking at all kinds of measures, for example, that will make our governments 
more transparent in the mobilization of the resources. We are putting the pressure not just on the governments but on the corporate sector because private companies have a responsibility too to, be, uh, to, to declare what they earn and to let people know so that they can follow up how their resources are being used. So we're looking for legislation, frameworks that will require companies to be open and transparent. And also we want human rights to be safeguarded because transparency alone cannot achieve what we want if the laws don't give freedom to, hum to people to speak up, to organize, to protest, then transparency by itself, disclosure by itself is not useful. So we want human rights frameworks, frameworks that protect the environment, and, and uh, frameworks that enable openness of information and, account and enable accountability. So uh, our focus is very much both on governments and the corporate sector. So how does one take this forward at a pan-African level? Because the risk will always be that there could potentially be a race to the bottom on many of these issues, yeah. and that countries would actually engage in very negative forms of competing with one another on some of these areas where there ought to be objective standards, ethical standards, clear standards. Is there a sense that at the same time that we are entering this cusp of opportunity on our continent, the risks are significant at a pan-African level. Your Excellency, perhaps over to you. We're also looking at the 10th anniversary of the African peer review mechanism. So is there an opportunity here to debate these issues much more profoundly at a pan-African level to really intervene and ensure that there is no race to the bottom on these issues of governance? Yes, I think that there's a, a good opportunity now to, to discuss uh, about this because some of our countries uh, taken by surprise, like in my country, for instance, we discover huge resources of different kind, kind minerals, gas, and we're still waiting for oil to come. Uh, so, but uh, our preparedness was not that much uh, uh, big. That's why at present, the government has decided to stop a bit to uh, uh, do a, a review of the legislation to see if it, it fits to the challenge which we uh, are being uh, uh, put for forward. And uh, also, the people, are, they don't under, understand what is happening. Once we discover gas, they think that now is time to distribute uh, money. Uh, and so, I spoke about the need of dialogue, constant dialogue. Uh, this time is a dialogue to uh, make people understand what is going on. Where is the gas? In which areas? How the gas will benefit the people? Where is coal? Where is iron? How these things are going to benefit the, the people? What is the relationship between the uplifting of the standard of living of people and the exploitation exploitation of uh, of, of these minerals and this gas. Uh, the, the people uh, must feel free to, to question. That's why I, I spoke about the inquisitive uh, spirit, which is increasing. Uh, now, it's up to the government to be open to listen and to give the correct explanation uh, and not, not everybody understands the, the message the same way. So uh, uh, that's why I'm saying it must be constant uh, so that everybody comes to a consensus of what is going on in, in, in the country. About the legislation, there are common standards in, in the region, even here in SADC, uh, about uh, how to conduct this uh, business on uh, natural resources. Uh, and uh, this is something which has to be discussed at sub-regional level, but also at the continental level. Uh, so that we, we see, we as Africans, how we see things. Because all the whole technology comes from the north, 
uh, the whole capital comes from the north. And uh, so we have to, to see how, where do we fit. We, we, we may not just say, oh, this uh, are our natural resources without having a, a legislation which uh, a, may really uh, make the foreigners who come to observe uh, the, 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 what we want, what our people want. Uh, so this has to be a common, a common thing in, in, in Africa because country by country, we may have difficulties to negotiate. Uh, so all the business people who are here, they can, can come, each one of them, with a, his uh, attraction to the leadership, and we say that this is the best one, and you take that one, and he gives you his, uh, his offer. And, uh, and you say, okay, and then another one comes, and they start fighting, and this happened in my time, over gas, when we discovered the gas in the south. There were uh, two American companies who were at logs, and fortunately, both of them were corrupt, and they, they disappeared. Uh, and now we have the South Africans who came in and took over. So we need some legislation, but also consultation uh, among ourselves. Thank you. So a whole different tenor in the conversation between governments and citizens on the one hand, but also a whole different tenor of conversation between the private sector and the recipient governments who are the recipients of foreign direct investment in this context. How do you see these pan-African debates pan out between citizens on the one hand and governments, Mo, given the increased transparency, social media, youth populations who are in any event more demanding in the accountability questions of their governments. How do you see this pan-African level debate? Uh, I think it's, uh, it's, getting, uh, it's getting better and better. Uh, for a number of reasons, uh, uh, people are better connected now, and uh, uh, there's more transparency. Uh, the, the, the sort of leakage of information everywhere we, we're going to be able to read everybody's email, absolutely. So there is a huge uh, amount of information coming out, which is quite healthy. And uh, I think I'm. Je suis optimiste quand en fait la façon dont on va avancer dans ce sens. On le manque également de évolutions. On a constaté en fait euh, une évolution importante aux États-Unis car pour la première fois. An important government like the United States moving uh, to force transparency, transparency of contracts and oil and gas. That's wonderful. Uh, European Union usually uh, too late, but this time somehow they managed two weeks ago to pass a bill also to uh, copy and uh, match the uh, American initiative. Uh, for those who are not aware of this, this, this law forces all energy companies to declare their contracts. Because some companies signed very, very big contracts in some African countries or some other countries, uh, which nobody knows how much they're paying for the gas or for the oil. And I'm aware that even some countries, even the finance minister is not aware. And uh, obviously, this is a major problem. Uh, of course, uh, China say now it is a great friend of ours. And we look at China and say, well, are you going to match the Europeans and, and the Americans and show us also some transparency? We need to demand that. I don't know when they had the BRICS meeting here did President Zuma ask them to match this legislation or not? You know? I don't know. I think he should ask. What's the point of being in the BRICS if not ask the BRICS to really match the other guys also uh, 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 to uh, match that level of credibility? So these are our friends abroad helping us to force this level of transparency. Uh, 
we need to keep pressure on all our own governments to seek more and more transparency, and that is happening. And uh, I cannot resist just to mention something to President uh, Shisano. Uh, I am in the uh, board of an organization called uh, uh, the Natural Resource Charter. I don't know if you heard about them. Yes. Sir. Yes, because this is a bunch of wonderful academics led by Paul Collier of Oxford who produced a wealth of information to help countries exactly like Mozambique who discovered national resources and say, what are going to do now? How are going to go about it? You have all the answers and free of charge. Just give it to President Gobuza. It's very important he read it. <laughs> they, 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 so from the perspective then of a Transparency International, how does one have this pan-African conversation that brings in the private sector into a whole different discourse on accountability, particularly given the sectors in Africa that are booming? I think there's a lot of talk about disclosure. There has to be disclosure that you understand because you know transparency is not an end in itself. It is to permit accountability, okay? Uh, when I started TI Cameroon about 10 years ago, uh, we did something called budget tracking. We took the budget and went to every village and told them, well, listen, this is what the budget says for your village. And suddenly the citizens were awake and they will ask the parliamentarian, you know, where is the bridge, where is this, where is that? So the thing with the information we get now is that do the citizens understand it to be able to make people accountable? So I think as much as we push for disclosure and transparency, it should be in a form that those who need to use it can use it and make the people accountable. The trick is to make the demand increase, and the demand must increase on the side of the citizens. Look at North Africa, and that is it. If you don't get to the point where the citizens themselves require and want for change to happen because they're making their leaders accountable, then you could supply all this aggregate and complicated figures and stuff and contracts, put them online to guys who don't have computers, and we will just be chasing our tail. So I think we are going more again on emphasizing on complicated stuff, disclosure, but it should be in a form where those who need to use it can comprehend it. When you do that, then of course then you can federate Africans in their request, as they did with multipartism without knowing where they were going. So I think it's important to make sure that those who need to use it can use it. And this conversation about this interaction between citizens and their governments that requires a whole different mode of interaction in a sense. How do you see this debate? Because when we see the Twitter feed coming through and what I'm looking at on screen here is a significant emphasis on education, ensuring that the, the discourse between government and citizen actually facilitates the kind of deeper dialogue that all of you are hinting at. Ian, how do you see this from the perspective that you uh, engage these questions in your academic work and in your other work? Well, I would, I would just underscore what's been said uh, now that transparency is not enough. There also needs to be uh, a culture of accountability created. I was in a, in a discussion a few weeks ago with Nkosana Moyo from the Minds Foundation, the Mandela Institute for Development Studies, in which we were discussing this issue of transparency and he, he made the very uh, sharp observation, Moyo made the sharp observation that in many African countries, uh, corruption is completely transparent. <laughs> the, the problem is not transparency at all. It's, it's uh, that it's transparency with impunity. <laughs> and um, uh, so th there needs to be a, a culture of accountability and, and a changed expectations about um, uh, uncorrupt behavior, and this is why I think the Abraham Prize is so important, because it really s sets a standard out there, and and it validates the notion that um, uh, not being corrupt is a good thing, and and will be, and can be rewarded. But beyond that, I think it it I come back to uh, the issues about incentives. It, it just overwhelmingly important that unless people have incentives to behave well many people will not.
And so uh, it comes back to the economy and to the economic incentives that attach to political power uh, that really have to change. Indeed, Winnie, and then you, you certainly have emphasized to me both in the interaction we had prior to the session and indeed in your input today, the importance of this pan-African dimension, your concern about the race to the bottom. Do you see a willingness to have the pan-African conversation about the concerns about the race to the bottom that is a potential risk, particularly with respect to the sectors of the economy that are booming? Yeah, we have really to focus at three levels and, and uh, the pan-African uh, level is very important. The first is about how resources are collected, revenue collections. And there, the big issue that I see is that there is a real race to the bottom, that African governments are competing for these few companies that are going to come and invest in extraction and they are under so much pressure and advice from the World Bank and the IMF to create this enabling environment for the private sector. In the process, they really race down to open their economies to attract these companies, and they sacrifice labor standards, the human rights of people, their land rights, they sacrifice uh, uh, the fair share of people in the form of taxes by giving tax holidays and so on. So there's a need for African countries to agree on common standards that will regulate the extractive industries. And in that regard, I think ECOWAS is doing better because they are coming up with a mining code that could help to establish the standards that all the countries agree to and they don't continue opening themselves and making themselves vulnerable to, to the dictates of foreign companies. That's one. The other area is that when the resources are collected, they are allocated for the priorities of the African people, the majority. Here, there's a big role for parliaments, the allocation of those resources. And until we have really independent and powerful parliaments that can oversee these big executive offices, we will not get far on the path of allocating appropriately, putting money in health, in education, and in jobs for our young people. So the power of parliament, the governance institutions are critical. And lastly, having strong human rights frameworks that enable citizens to act and force their governments and corporations to act responsibly. Because without active citizens, you can't have responsible governments. And without putting people as the drivers with rights and have a human rights-based approach, a human rights approach, not based approach, but human rights approach to all these issues of governance, we will not get responsibility, accountability, and Africa owning its development. Thank you very much. I'm going to turn it over to all of you. I'm sure that you have a number of burning questions for the panel as well. I'm also encouraging those of you who are sending us Twitter feed again, just hashtag WEF governance. I'd like to just put it to you for questions to the panel. Please ensure that your questions are as crisp as possible. Speeches are not necessarily encouraged, but I'd like to open it up to the audience for questions. If you could please indicate by raise of hands. I have a, there are roving microphones. There's a question here in front. Mohammed uh, Abu Jakra, I'm from our Global Shaper, and I'm from Egypt. Um, my question is about the, 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 the effect of election as a real measurement for good governance in a country. I mean, having uh, the experience of being an Egyptian and had went through several uh, elections in the, in the last uh, three uh, two years, and I still see uh, a high level of uh, dissatisfaction on the national level. I can't say that that they weren't as fair as expected, but they didn't bring to the power those who really um, uh, needed the change and made the change. Um, so this is fair. As a second, the relationship. I mean, the level of disclosure that we want. 
are we really looking just only for uh, access to information and disclosure of information or a real participatory uh, role for civil society in decisions before being taken? I mean, uh, the government of Egypt after the revolution with the influence of civil society put, uh, uh, put the, the budget with scanned copies, scanned PDF uh, pictures online, uh, ineffective and non-participatory. So what is the real role of civil society when it comes to disclosure and, and participation in the decision-making process? Thank you. Thank you. In fact, this is an issue that has also consistently been coming through the Twitter feed. What is the role of civil society, civil society organizations? How do civil society organizations interact from a transparency perspective? Your Excellency? Well, <clears throat> in what concerns the elections, it is related with the, the alternance. I think what is important is to, uh, to have good legislation on a, a, the electoral process. Uh, because uh, the alternance must be done according to the wishes of the people. And this can be attained only if the machinery for electoral process is well uh, established and the legislation is, is a, a consensual legislation. I know that it has to be discussed uh, again and again to correct some shortcomings of the previous legislation, but it's very important uh, to have elections which are uh, reliable, which are credible. Uh, also the institutions uh, sometimes when in Mozambique, for instance, we started without knowing how to create the institutions to run the, 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 the elections, but we are perfect, uh, becoming more perfect as uh, 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 new elections occur. But the discussion did not stop yet. So it's very important to have a, a good machinery for, for, for the electoral process so that you have uh, the people to choose the people whom they want to choose. The second thing is uh, that uh, there are people who may think that they are the ones who should be elected. They predetermine that they are the ones who should be elected. And if they lose, they say, no, the elections were, were rigged uh, because they didn't win. If they win, they say, oh, all right, these elections were, 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 were good. And the result is that they don't deliver. And so there's cowards and so on. Uh, so it's, it's a, a, a situation which deserves very much attention. A lot of education of the, electro, uh, uh, the voters, uh, they must be very well uh, educated and you don't do this uh, of a sudden. In Africa, even in the countries which uh, uh, are independent for a long, long time, you still need a lot of education so that people understand their rights, even the right to go and vote. We have to tell the citizens, yeah, it's your right, you go and vote. And many do not know this, so a, a lot of education is necessary. Uh, in what concerns the, uh, the role of the civil society, first of all, there's this uh, very difficult discussion about who is the civil society. You will find who is the civil society. There are some people who do not want to create parties, but through the, uh, the door of civil society, they do exactly what political parties do. And so you, 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 you fail to have a good understanding between the power and the debt civil society. Uh, a good civil society should uh, uh, create uh, really good trust and uh, be uh, free to bring uh, good discussion uh, with the people and not, not fight for power, but fight to have a correct uh, government a, a correct leadership uh, in, in power. But uh, some do not do that. 
they behave as if they were political parties in opposition. Uh, so this creates some clashes, and, and, and so the dialogue is, is broken there. Some act as just uh, NGOs, uh, demanding uh, some money to do this, some money to do that, some money to do that, and, and uh, not addressing to the uh, real issues. So uh, uh, there's a, a, a discussion about what, what is this civil society? For instance, we say civil society should be responsible for conducting the elections. And we want a civil society which is neutral, which is independent. And sometimes you, 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 cannot, you cannot find it. You cannot find it. So it's, a, it's a, the participation of, of the, the, the civil society would be a, an excellent thing if the civil society is independent, is a neutral, and it's constructive. Akiri? I, I was, th that's a long debate uh, about what civil society is. The problem is all the important issues in Africa today are highly political. You can't run away from it. Our elections don't work. We have human rights issues. And all these issues are highly political. So I would say civil society is, you can engage in these issues, but not under any banner. And so that's the reality. In the North, the issues are social, mostly. But in our countries, we are still trying to put together the basic infrastructure for a citizen to be able to express himself and to be able to make his leader accountable. So all these issues are highly political. The, if you look at after the 90s, most of the leaders that came in were all from civil society. Is it from Mali? You just go through all these countries. It's because the issues that interrogate us in Africa today are highly political. If we don't fix it, then we'll continue to have the civil society, which feels at one point I'm going to advocate, and another point it feels maybe I can do better if I'm in the ring. And that is the ambivalence we have. We don't fix the issues as yet, and so we're going to have this confusion which the president so clearly uh, describes. I can see that there are a number of panelists that want to also speak. Winnie, and then I'm going to go back to the audience. So yeah, Winnie clearly raised her hand. About civil society, you see, increasingly we are finding that our countries are growing. Growth is increasing all the time. They are moving from low income to middle income status. But they are leaving the majority of the people behind. The poverty is not declining as fast as the growth is rising. So we find in civil society that increasingly many organizations are moving away from being in service delivery and concentrating on influencing because the resources are there. The growth is happening, but inequality is widening. So they are focusing on asking governments, asking corporations, to do the right thing to fight poverty. But as, we, as our civil society organizations move towards more influencing, then this also strikes fear in the governments and we find civil society space now closing more, more laws to regulate, to control, to, to actually render voiceless civil society, to squeeze them because they are focused on speaking more than uh, delivering service on the ground. So this is an issue here in Africa. And what we are saying is that, no, let the people speak. Let the people speak, let them drive their development. And influencing is not the same. Mr. President, I, I, I want to differ a little here. When civil society is influencing, it is not directly seeking to take power, but to make power do the right thing for the people. Yes, There's a difference. Yes, so, I have uh, another two. I, actually, I have three hands, and I will take them in that order, if I may. One, two, and then three. And I think that may bring us close to. Yes, please. Just looking for the roving microphone. <laughs> Excuse me. 
Um, when we talk about good governance, a lot of times we talk about corruption, and uh, which is endemic and destroys economies because it attracts very bad investors and uh, very good investors would shy away. Um, but we always talk about it from the standpoint of the person accepting the corruption. You know, what do we do? How do we hold accountable those organizations, those companies, and those individuals who engage in corruption and who give the money um, to distort the system? And indeed, what innovations do we see? What innovations do we see in terms of really focusing on the private sector in the governance debate? Mo? Uh, well, what we see actually is uh, increasing prosecution, especially in the United States. I think the only government I noticed which taking the Foreign Corruption Act or Anti-Corruption Act a little bit seriously is the United States for all its faults. I think the U.S. is doing mm -hmm. something useful here. Uh, Europe, I mean, I, I notice OCD, for example, uh, issued a very strong report early this year questioning France's commitment to uh, fighting corruption, uh, noting that they never tried anybody. What's the point of passing anti-corruption laws when you are not really using them? And this problem is not only in France, in many European countries. I made the remark the other day that uh, I was in the European Union and talking to some, and uh, the United States actually fines a lot of European companies for corruption in Africa, much more than European countries uh, uh, fine or punish European companies for corruption. And I asked the, our friends in the Commission, I mean, Europe has serious financial problems. United States, last, last time they, they fined European companies $700 million. So I asked the Commission, I said, why, why don't you European guys find your own companies and make use of this money to plug your, 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 your finance gap? Why did the Americans take this money from your... So we, we have a very, in my view, insufficient uh, uh, commitment, really, to fight corruption. And I was so... I, I, even the, some people, I mean, was it Balisconi in the last uh, election when he stood up and said, actually, uh, you know, bribery is good. It means uh, jobs for our boys. Hmm. This is a serious candidate to be a prime minister of a very respectable European country, standing up and saying that in public. <laughs> so that, that's unfortunately uh, uh, the situation as far as the private uh, sector is concerned. This issue about corporate governance, which is, is I think is very, uh, uh, in very really bad shape, and uh, there is a need really to focus in that area. So not only focusing on governments, but very clearly focusing on the toolkit that can also be used to ensure that on the private sector side, we really bring the private sector into the discourse much Absolutely. more aggressively. I had another hand in front here, if I can have the microphone. Actually, I've been waiting with the mic for a while, so could Sorry. I ask a question for Dr. Ibrahim? I actually just, uh, and then your, your turn, please. Thank you very much. My name is Wadi Ait Hamza. I'm a global shaper from the Rabat Hub, and I work at the Rabat School of Governance and Economics. Um, before asking my question, I want just to... to I'm, I'm really um, dizzled at one word that we use so much now. It's good governance. Hmm. I think it really is a bad word. It's like when we say a good citizen. We should have one citizen. We should have one governance. There is no bad or good governance. And my question is related to one of the top priorities that, we, that we've been discussed here in the World Economic Forum on Africa, it is education. Taking into account that higher education is already an elitist in our country, in South Africa only 28% of the, of the population have uh, the high school degree, in Morocco it's only 14%. So to what extent can we include education in educating the next generation about governance at the primary level, uh, especially that it can help. So what can, what, 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 what uh, my question is, 
What has been done to answer this question? And if not, what can be done? Thank you. Indeed, again, a lot of the tweets coming through as well, emphasizing education, emphasizing the right to vote. Yes. Winnie. Well, I think that really the in active citizenship is learned not necessarily through the formal system only. The formal school system, yes. But I think people learn to be active citizens starting from their families, where they are given a chance to voice, to be part of family decision making, to take responsibility and do some things, be required to do some work, and then in the community, and then in the formal school system. So really building the culture of democracy is a societal thing. Yes, you can build it in the school curriculum, but you can also build it through the way we are socialized in the family, in the community. And I think in Africa, we need to think seriously about this because somehow uh, many of our cultures have these uh, this, this education is actually there already, but needs to be enhanced, needs to be affirmed. You, you find it there in the culture. But I wanted to also add that um, the, we believe in the power of people in civil society. And the corporate sector can really respond when you use the power of people. Recently at Oxfam, we had a campaign we called Behind the Brands Campaign. And we wanted to make the corporate sector responsible. We picked the 10 big food companies. We scored them, just like Mo Ibrahim here scores. We scored them against seven indicators and put out the record. Then we targeted those which make chocolate. And we said to them, Take care of women cocoa farmers in your food chains. And you know what? Nestle, Mars, Mondelez have now responded and agreed to give better wages to the women cocoa farmers, to improve their working conditions, and to be champions for gender equality in the food chains. But how did we do it? We appealed to their consumers, the people who enjoy a chocolate bar, the women who buy it for their kids. And so the companies came on board and they are doing what they must do. So people power. So very innovative ways as well to hold the private sector accountable. I had another hand here in front, please. So uh, I'm with a company called HCL Technologies. I have a question for Dr. Ibrahim. So through this entire discussion, you know, one of the things that I kept hearing was uh, the underlying need for transparency, along with the Pan-Africa discussion, discourse, with inclusive growth, human development built in, so on and so forth. And something that just struck me, which sort of fits the bill on all those parameters, is a digital economy. So question for you, Dr. Ibrahim, is there, is there a possibility of a digitization initiative that is rolled out from anywhere, which is a Pan-Africa initiative, which sets rules, conditions, for participation amongst the various countries that constitute the continent. Uh, so I'm sorry, maybe it is late in the day. I want to say I don't understand. Do you, what do you mean by this digital? What I mean uh, what is, is, so if you take the power of cloud computing, mobility, basically the extension of the telco process, oh. and you're able to therefore start doing business, encourage entrepreneurship, financial systems, disclosure, et cetera, et cetera, over the web, uh, as expressed through mobile devices, computers, so on and so forth. Uh, could that be an initiative that could be run, uh, Pan-Africa, is, is the question. I think it's already happening. I mean, when you talk about how all this social media, all, all this uh, tweeting, the, all that is, is already taking place. I don't you know, what, what are we waiting for? It is happening. The young African people now are better connected, than, much far better connected than our generation. People need to understand, when I was your age, my country had one newspaper published by the government. We had one TV station, one radio station run by the government. All what we see in our TV station, what our president had for breakfast, what he had for lunch, 
and what he saw before he goes to sleep. That's all. To get to, 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 to buy a photocopier, you need to get a permission from the police. <laughs> that is true. So people need to understand there is a, a real revolution in technology which enabled people now to communicate directly without the need of intermediate or the real role the government playing the role of, of a policeman. It already happened. It, it takes very shape, which is iCloud, which is you know, mobile, whatever it is, technology is an enabler, uh, uh, really for transparency, for communication, for people to organize. I mean, this gentleman from Egypt, I, they can see how technology helped really uh, 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 the revolution, although the revolution was stolen later on, and I understand you are dissatisfied with that. And just one word here, uh, democracy cannot be learned over one night. You know, it is, is <laughs> and this issue about financing of political parties, and issue, a lot of issues there which I can talk to you outside uh, about it. Yes, you are, you are right, to but it's there. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, I am mindful of the time, but I do see a very, very eager question to my right, which I am going to, with your indulgence, allow before we summarize, please. Thank you, thank you Madam Chair. I'll be very quick. Uh, the biggest problem I see in terms of corporate governance is the transparency. Uh, the resources of Africa have been planted by people taking money outside Africa, stash it into safe havens in Europe. My question to Transparency International, why are you not doing something so that we all know that money which was illegally taken out of Africa, stash it somewhere in Europe, how much is it? Why should it not come back to, 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 to the countries where it was ill-gotten? Because if we don't do that, and we talk about uh, corporate governance, it's a complete waste of time when we have not owned up. We think the money that was taken out of Africa is more than what is needed by way of developmental financing for these countries in Africa. Deal with it up front. Thank you. Akere? Well, you know, uh, I am actually heading a group of people who just say what you're saying. And the lady up front who spoke about corruption really hit the nail on the head about a discourse today. I am a lawyer by training, and I keep asking myself, why is it that when a kleptocrat or a political leader goes to Europe and puts 20 million in the bank, he is corrupt, and then the handler of the corrupt goods, nothing is said about him. And we have to get to a point who will realize that the guy who holds the money is equally as guilty as the guy who put the money there. Better still, we are moving towards a, a, a situation in the, in, in the Pan-African Lawyers Union. We are going to ask that when the proceedings are going on, there is no moral reason for the frozen money to be in the hands of the person who was an, accom an accomplice. So you don't have $9 million belonging to Mobutu or whoever sitting in the very bank that was an accomplice. You should go to the African Developing Bank as, a, uh, as an interim or, or trustee to hold this money. There's no reason, there's no reason why we, we say it over and over again and the guys who cooperate and entice people to bring the money to keep it in their banks, then the money is frozen in their banks, and we talk about the person who brought it there, but the guy who is keeping the money, using it to speculate, and nothing is said about him. I think that's where the discourse must go. I think you've just had a very categorical reply, which I hope you found inspiring. I certainly have, and I would like to just touch on a number of the issues that I think have really emerged very strongly from the panel. There is clearly a whole new nature of the discourse between governments and their citizens in terms of the demand for transparency, the demand for particularly enhanced conversation about how the unlocking of resources on our continent will benefit a very youthful population that is adamant about accountability. I think certainly what has emerged very, very strongly is that the innovations around the role of the private sector are as important 
as debates on governance in terms of leaders who are in the public sector. So I think that you certainly have had a, a wealth of input from a highly esteemed panel, all of whom in their daily lives take the governance issues very, very seriously in how they institutionalize some of these very innovations, Mo and others, Transparency International, we look to not only you to continue the innovations, but also in our own hands to participate in the innovations that will shape our continent in the governance debate as we stand at the cusp of opportunity. And I'd like to thank my entire panel for their wonderful contributions. And I'd also like to thank those of you who tweeted for your tweets and certainly for all of you for your participation. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, panelists. Thank you very much. Thank you.